Thank you and good morning. This has been a, I mean, a really interesting conference for me to, to I, I often don't hear this perspective on security and offense and defense. And I'm sort of speaking to you all from my world of securing systems. And I want to talk about how I think they'll affect this world and I guess the world more generally. Uh, I'm going to draw on several different threads and try to look at sort of where we are and where we're going. Uh, when I look at the world, I see a world where everything is becoming a computer. And it's an important change. And Tomas talked about it somewhat. I want to give it my little spin. It, it, we think of, you know, this is not a phone. This is a computer that makes phone calls. And that's a very important difference. And it's not just this device. Your refrigerator is a computer that keeps things cold. And your microwave oven is a computer that makes things hot. An ATM machine is a computer with money inside. Your car is a computer with four wheels and an engine. Actually, that's not entirely true. Your car is a 100 plus computer distributed system with four wheels and an engine. And this is a change that's happening at all levels of our lives. You read the press, you hear this called the Internet of Things, but it's really more than the Internet of Things. It's a confluence of many different computing trends that are turning everything in our life into a computer. And this has two important ramifications. It means that what is traditionally internet security becomes everything security. And it means that all the lessons from internet security become broadly applicable to everything. So let me start by giving six lessons of computer internet security that will become broadly applicable. Or maybe not lessons, maybe truisms. The first one is that most software is poorly written and insecure. So this is true for everything. Basically, the market doesn't want to pay for secure software. Now, you might know the joke, good, fast, cheap, pick any two. Works for restaurants, works for computers. And the market has generally picked fast and cheap over good. But given the choice, that's what we prefer. This is true throughout pretty much everything. And it has two ramifications for us in computer security. That's right, one, poor software is full of bugs, and some bugs are vulnerabilities. So all software contains vulnerabilities, hundreds, thousands, lots of different estimates. We don't really know how many. But you know this is true because your computers are updated monthly with security patches. And this is going to be true for the foreseeable future. We don't know how to design software that doesn't have bugs in it. The second truism is that the internet was never designed with security in mind. Now, it might seem odd in 2018 saying that, but back in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, it was conventional wisdom. Now, two basic reasons. Back then, the internet wasn't being used for anything important. And two, there were organizational constraints about who got access to the internet. Right? So for those two reasons, designers consciously made decisions not to add security into the fabric of the internet. Not that they didn't think about it, but they believed the best place to address any security requirements was at the endpoints. If you had an application that needed security, you would build into the application. And the internet itself wouldn't have any security. And we're still living with the effects of that decision. Whether it's the domain name system, the internet routing system, the security of internet packets, security of email and email addresses. I mean, we're all living with the insecurities that deliberately weren't added back when those protocols were invented. The third truism is extensibility. And Tomas talked about this nicely. He uh, talked about it as universal computing. This is the notion that you can't constrain the functionality of a computer because it is, it is a general purpose device. And this is a difference between computers and the rest of the world. And something that I think, that I think many people don't understand. So when I was growing up, I had a telephone in my home, big black thing with a wire. It was a really good telephone, 
But no matter how hard I tried, it couldn't be anything other than a telephone. This, of course, is a computer that makes phone calls, and it can do anything I want. Right? That's what there's an app for that means. Because this is a computer, it can be programmed to do anything in a way a conventional electromechanical telephone cannot. So this has ramifications for us. It means that these systems are constantly evolving and they're very hard to secure because the designers can't anticipate every use condition, every function. It also means these devices can be upgraded with new functionality. And that's what malware is. Right? Malware is a functional upgrade. It's one you didn't want, one you didn't ask for, one you don't need, one given to you by somebody else. And a computer can be infected with malware in the way that a non-computer cannot. Fourth truism is, is, is complexity. Tomas did a great job on that. I, I will be very quick. Complexity is the worst enemy of security. I think it's correct to think of the internet as the most complex machine mankind has ever built, by a lot. And a lot of reasons why this is so, Tomas gave some. I'll give one for, more from military strategy. That the defender occupies the position of the interior in defending a system, and the more complex a system is, the more potential attack points there are. Attacker has to find one way in, defender has to defend all of them. So that as the systems get more complex, the attack surface gets larger. And Tomas is correct that we are designing systems that are getting more complex faster than our ability to secure them. And so security is getting better, but complexity is getting faster, faster, and we are losing ground as we keep up. And this means that attack is easier than defense across the board. It also means that security testing is very hard. <clears throat> My fifth point, and related, is that there are new vulnerabilities in the interconnections. As we connect things to each other, vulnerabilities in one thing affect other things. Right, so 2016, the Mirai botnet, these were vulnerabilities in DVRs and CCT cameras that allowed hackers to build a, a DDoS system that was arrayed against a uh, domain name server that dropped about 20, 30 popular websites. 2013, Target Corporation, United States retailer, attacked by someone who stole the credentials of their HVAC contractor of several mid-Pennsylvania stores. Uh, last year, a great story, a uh, casino in Vegas was hacked through, I'm not making this up, their internet-connected fish tank. Right? And these vulnerabilities can be hard to fix because sometimes there's no one system that's at fault. Right? We can blame the fish tank, we can blame the HVAC contract contractor, but sometimes it's not that easy. It could be an insecure interaction of two secure systems. So a couple of weeks ago, there was a vulnerability announced in PGP, email security program. It was not actually a vulnerability in PGP. It was a vulnerability that arose because of the way PGP handled encryption and the way modern email programs handled embedded HTTP, embedded URLs. Right? Those two together allowed an attacker to craft an email message, actually to modify an existing email message that he couldn't read in such a way that when it was delivered to the uh, recipient, or victim in this case, a copy of the plain text would be sent to the attacker's web server. A really interesting vulnerability, and as you read the discussion that happened before it was released, there were email, uh, individual providers of email of the, of the PGP uh, program that said, this isn't my problem, I'm not gonna fix it. Right? A reasonable conclusion but if nobody fixes it, it doesn't get fixed. About a couple of months ago, I blogged uh, something similar. There's an interaction between the way Google handles email addresses. I don't know if you know this, but dots and email addresses in Gmail don't matter. 
So Bruce Schneier at gmail.com is the exact same address as Bruce.schneier at gmail.com. The dots don't matter. Well, you can use that fact and the fact that Netflix, the dots do matter, to get a Netflix account in someone else's name. Not that exciting, but then that someone else will pay your bill. And again, it's hard to know who's exactly at fault here. It's an interaction between two different and perfectly reasonable ways of interpreting email addresses. My last point is that attacks always get better. They always get easier, they always get faster, they always get, always get more powerful. Several reasons why this is so. First is computers get faster. You've seen this if you've been watching passwords the past couple of decades. What counts as a secure password is constantly changing as just the speed of password crackers get faster. It's also true because att attackers get smarter and adapt. You talk to people from safety engineering and they don't really quite understand this. Right? When you have to engineer against a tornado, you don't have to worry about the tornadoes adapting to whatever defensive measures you put in place. Right? The tornadoes don't get smarter. But attackers against ATM machines, and cars, and everything else do. And expertise flows downhill. Today's top secret NSA program has become tomorrow's PhD theses, and the next day is hacker tools. So decisions we make based on an environment aren't necessarily true as things improve. An example would be uh, IMS eye catchers, uh, stingray devices, fake cell phone towers. I'm going to use this example again later, but what these are are basically fake cell phone towers that allow an attacker to get information about the cell phones in the vicinity. And this, is, this is possible because when this cell phone protocol was designed, there was no security in the system that paired the phone with a nearby tower. So I turn this phone on, it says, hi, here I am. A tower says, hi, I'm a tower. And then this device automatically trusts that tower. There's no authentication. And that made sense when the protocol was designed because creating a fake cell phone tower was very hard. Then it became easy enough for governments to do. The FBI was using it for investigations, keeping it very secret. Uh, countries were using it for espionage. Then it became easier. We saw demonstrations of hackers doing it at DEF CON four or five years ago. You can build an IMSI catcher yourself with a software-defined radio card and some software. You can buy one now, Alibaba.com. Last time I checked, they're about $1,000. Right, so the decisions that were made to keep that, not to add security to the protocol, which then made sense because it was hard to hack, now it's easy to hack. And we see this again and again and again. So those are my six truisms. Those are the things that are true and are likely to be true for a while now. They're not going to change anytime soon. And up to now, this has largely been a manageable problem in computer security. Like we're doing pretty much okay. And for a variety of reasons, I think that's changing. Specifically, I want to talk about automation, autonomy, and physical agency. That these three things are changing computing and bringing new dangers. So traditionally, in computer security, we're concerned about confidentiality. So if you study this, you've learned about the CIA triad which is not that CIA, it's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The three main things that we're concerned about in computer security. This is doctrine from the 1970s, it's not new. And we can add things like anonymity, but the you know, CIA are the three things we tend to worry about. Traditionally, most computer security concerns itself with confidentiality. Right? Privacy, data theft, data misuse. That's what we're worried about. When you see the big hacks in the press, that's generally what they're, they're hacking. Right? The OPM breach we heard about yesterday, confidentiality. The Equifax breach, confidentiality. Doesn't mean there aren't other threats. There are availability threats. 
You think of DDoS attacks, think of ransomware. There are certainly data integrity threats, manipulating bank balances. Right? But largely, confidentiality is what we've been doing and what we've been worried about. But as you add automation, autonomy, and physical agency, the integrity and availability threats become much worse than the confidentiality threats. The effects are greater, and there are real risks to life and property. So I'm, I'm certainly concerned if a hospital is hacked and my confidential medical records are stolen. But I'm much more concerned if the hackers change my blood type. I'm concerned if someone hacks my car and uses the microphone to ease up on the conversations. But I'm much more worried if they disable my brakes. In the first case, that is a data integrity attack. In the second case, that is a data availability attack. And as computers affect the world, those attacks have real world consequences. And remember, everything is becoming a computer. So think of cars, medical devices, drones, weapon systems, thermostats, power plants, smart city, anything. And we should expect DDoS attacks against critical systems. We should expect ransomware against our cars. And there's a fundamental difference between your spreadsheet crashes and you lose your data and your car crashes and you lose your life even though it could be the same CPU, the same operating system, the same application software, the same vulnerability, and the same attack software. Because the computer is doing something different, the effects become different. And these trends become more critical as our systems become more capable and more, and more critical themselves. And so in, in computer security, we worry about class breaks. It's not the retail attack of somebody going to your car and manually disabling the brakes like they did in the movies. It's a hack that disables all the brakes. Or uh, probably more realistically, all the brakes of one model or maybe one model year. And if you follow the attack against... Uh, Amity. Amity uh, makes uh, hotel room uh, access cards, like the one we're using in this hotel. I don't know, I don't know if it's that brand, but it's, it's a similar brand. Last year, there was a hack that resulted in all of them being vulnerable. Not just yours, not just this hotel's, all of them on the planet. But hundreds of thousands of hotel rooms. A class break that attacked the class of systems the fix was to manually go to each hotel room door and update the system. Something that my guess hasn't been done in most places. So here we are, still vulnerable. Sleep well tonight. <laughs> and so that's the change. At the same time, we have some very long standing security systems that are starting to fail in this new environment. So the first one is patching. Let's talk about patching. Patching is how we get security. Since we can't design systems that are secure out of the box, we lack the expertise and so the economics isn't there, the way we get security for these things is through patching. Right, so actually there are two reasons. First one is there are engineers at, in this case Apple, but also Microsoft and Google, that do their best to design them securely in the first place. My big teams of engineers working hard and spending a lot of money. At the same time, those same teams of engineers quickly write and distribute patches to these devices when vulnerabilities are discovered. And you know, multiple times a month, your devices are patched. If you have a Windows computer, it's Patch Tuesday. You have an Apple, it's, it's on demand. Other devices have their own schedules. So this ecosystem of quickly recovering and regaining security doesn't really work for low-cost embedded systems. Think of DVRs, think of home routers. They're built at a much lower profit margin. They're built offshore by third parties. They just don't have dedicated security teams associated with those devices. Right? Teams come together, build them, and then disband. 
Even worse, many of these devices have no way to patch their software. Right now, the way you update your home router is you throw it away and buy a new one. That's the patch mechanism. I don't know if you were following, uh, earlier this week, by the end of last week, uh, the FBI told us all to reboot our routers. I think it's very odd when the FBI becomes your sysadmin, but we have, there we have it. And, and what they're doing is they're trying to get rid of a piece of malware on these routers that's, that's persistent, in that it, it survives uh, reboots. I'm not convinced their advice will work for many routers, because there isn't a way to reset them that, that restores security or updates. Right? They, they're assuming that if uh, you do a hard reset, and this is not just unplug it, this is stick a paperclip in the hole and, and, and reset it and then reconfigure it, which means pretty much no one's going to do it. And that might work to clear what's on there, but it's not going to clear the vulnerability that put it on there. Because we can't do that. Now, throw it away and buy a new one is, is really lousy security device, but in a lot of ways it works. We get security on these phones because regularly we throw them away and buy a new one. I guess we give them to our relatives and buy a new one. Uh, we replace our phones every well, three or so years, our computers every three to five years, and our new models are more secure. They have more security features. This isn't true for embedded systems. We replace our DVRs about every seven to ten years, our refrigerators every 25 years. I bought a new thermostat for my home last year. I expect to replace it approximately never. And you know, you think about a, think about a car today. When you buy a car, software's probably two years old. Figure you'll drive it for ten years, sell it, someone else will buy it, drive for ten years, sell it. Here we are in Tallinn, so it'll be put on a boat, sent to probably somewhere in Africa, where someone else will buy it, drive for another 20 years. You go home, find yourself a computer from 1976, boot it up. Try to run it, try to make it secure. We have no idea how to secure 40-year-old systems at the consumer level. We haven't a clue. There is a reason that Microsoft and Apple will depreciate their operating systems after a few generations. It is too expensive to maintain them. When you start moving to consumer devices, you will be expected to maintain them for decades. And so imagine a car company is going to need uh, a test bed of 10 models times 40 years equals 400 cars. That's hard. That might be unsolvably hard. And the solution of throw them away earlier is going to cook the planet. So that's not viable either. And we don't know how to solve this. The second thing that's starting to fail is authentication. And authentication sort of has always worked, but sort of just barely. You might, human memorizable passwords have always been hard. They got harder. And now we're in a situation where, in many cases, they just don't work. Two-factor authentication is better. We're trying to convince people to use it in more and more applications. There are situations where it's just not suitable. You all forget your passwords, so we need backup authentication systems. Those are uniformly terrible. If you think about it, any backup system is, is worse than the primary system it backs up, which is not really a good place to be. And the amount of authentication we have to do is about to explode. Authentication we're, authentication we're used to is people authenticating to things, right, to objects or services. But we're going to have to go the other way, things authenticating to people, and even worse, things authenticating to things. The amount of computers in your personal environment is going to explode exponentially. If you have a hundred devices in your home, on your person, that need to talk to each other, that's 10,000 authentications. You have a thousand devices, that's a million authentications. We do not know how to authenticate at scale. 
Or more importantly, we don't know how to authenticate without us being involved. And so already you have things authenticating the things. You step into your car, your phone automatically authenticates to your car, and you can use the speakers and microphone in the car to make phone calls. We know how to do that. That's Bluetooth. But if you think about it, the reason that works is that you were there to set it up. Right? You manually paired your phone and your computer. You can do that with one thing. You can do that with ten things. You're not going to do it with a thousand. You're definitely not going to do it with a million. Right? And also right now, this device is kind of your de facto IoT controller. If you have an Internet of Things, pretty much anything, chances are you're controlling it through your phone. Again, this will work for one, for ten, for a few dozen things. It won't scale to a thousand. So this is a big authentication problem. Automatically authenticating things to things. Now your car drives to an intersection, needs to authenticate itself to the sensors, the traffic lights, back and forth. And this will happen in many situations. The third thing that's failing is, is our supply chain. And Tomas talked about this really nicely. And I want to give some other examples. So in this year, the United States government took actions against Kaspersky, because we did not trust Russian antivirus software, and ZTE, because we did not trust Chinese-made computers and phones. And this is a supply chain issue. There was a belief we don't know how, how true, how founded. There was a belief that these devices could have malware installed by those respective governments that we could use to, to spy on us, uh, disable things. And the decision was made not, not to use them in some circumstances. This is not just a U.S. issue. Uh, 2014, China actually banned Kaspersky and the U.S. company Symantec for similar concerns. 2017, India uh, listed 42 smartphone apps that they believed China had backdoored. You go back to 1997, there was belief among many countries that the Israeli company Checkpoint had been backdoored by their government. Uh, 2008, uh, there was a, a program, uh, an encryption program designed by Al Qaeda called Mujahideen Secrets. And the stated reason we, people were told to use this is that Western cryptography products were backdoored by their governments. The only reasonable thing an Al-Qaeda person could use was an Al-Qaeda designed and written encryption software. Actually amazingly dumb advice, but uh, there you have it. And this, but this is just the beginning of the problem. This is, this is just, you know, what country does the company who makes this product reside in? Right, Tomas talked about the problem of, of chip fabs. Even this, which is a U.S. company, this device is not made in the U.S. And we have to trust the, the, the places the chips are made, the places the devices are built. We also have to trust where the software is written. Many companies have uh, software engineers in many other countries. We have to trust where the programmers are from. Think of something like Windows, probably has programmers from at least over 100 nationalities. All writing code that goes into the operating system. And we've, we've discovered backdoors in Juniper firewalls, in D-Link routers. Really interesting story from 2003. Someone we don't know who almost slipped a very subtle and very well-designed backdoor into Linux. Right? A programmer got it into the software, and we caught it really by accident. And how many others? We, we have no idea. Right? There's, there's even more here. We have to trust the distribution mechanism as well. There are fake apps in the Google Play Store. We read from one of the Snowden documents. NSA installed a backdoor into telephone equipment, Cisco switching equipment, destined for the Syrian telephone company. 
There's a great paper last year, you can hack a smartphone through a malicious replacement screen. Surprise! Right, so the security of your smartphone depends on the supply chain of the screens. The piece of glass that sits in front of the object. This is a hard problem. Right? We can't trust anyone, yet we have no choice but to trust everyone. Now, this is a military audience. You know the answer. Your supply chains are too long. Make them shorter. That's pretty much impossible right now. Our tech industry is too global, is too interconnected. You cannot tell Apple you are now going to make your phone programmed only by U.S. citizens, only U.S. parts, only made and assembled in the U.S. Right? U.S. only, no foreign. Right? That's not going to happen. Yet we really have no better answer right now. So I kind of see this as a perfect storm. And security is failing just as everything is becoming connected and capable. And we've largely been okay with the tech industry as it is, unregulated, because it didn't matter. And it's no longer sustainable right now. So primarily this is a, this is a policy problem. And getting the policy right is crucial. I've just finished a book that will be out in September that talks about this. It speaks to the policy things that we have to do to improve security. I talk about standards and regulations and liabilities. I think it's a very hard political battle. That the industry does not want to be regulated. I also think it's inevitable. Because governments regulate things that can kill people. I'm, also, I'm afraid that at least in the U.S. we're not going to have the discussion until there's some catastrophe. Right, perhaps Europe will do better. A GDPR is the most aggressive privacy regulation. I think uh, the EU is going to look at security next. And right now the EU is a regulatory superpower on the planet. But as we go forward, I think there's a policy principle that we need to embrace and might be difficult for this crowd. And that's defense has to dominate. That we can no longer live in a world where we allow for offense to dominate because it's just simply too dangerous. In, in the old days, it was easy to mix offense and defense. Think of the original mission of the NSA was twofold. To attack enemy communication systems and defend friendly communication systems. And you could do that because they were different. The Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, had different equipment. Different frequencies, different standards, different everything. And you could attack these systems without worrying about these systems. That's no longer true. One world, one network, one answer. Today, everyone has the same stuff. We all use Windows computers, TCP IP, Cisco routers. Both the good guys and the bad guys use the same stuff. So we have to make one choice. Either we design them to secure for everybody, which means the good guy's stuff is secured and the bad guy's stuff is secured, or we design them to be able to spy, in which case both sides can do that. And a good example are the IMSI catchers, the, the stingrays I talked about earlier. And they were designed to facilitate spying. And maybe that was an okay decision when the FBI and the NSA were the only ones who can do it. Uh, there was an uh, a article in the Washington Post, I think it was earlier this year, but actually this research was done in about 2014. You can drive around Washington, D.C. and find these IMSI catchers pretty much everywhere. Around U.S. government buildings, around foreign embassies, that are run by we actually don't know who. So yes, this could be an 
FBI investigative tool so secret that they would drop prosecutions rather than discuss it in court. But now it's something that everybody does. You see the same thing with uh, uh, routing security. So there's something called the border gateway protocol, which is how the internet decides how to route packets. Old protocol, no security at all. And you can read from the Snowden documents that the NSA used this for something called traffic shaping. So they wanted to spy on an asset over here. They would convince that asset to send its data across a, a, a network that it was able to listen on. Right? Fine offensive capability. We're seeing it more and more being used by we don't know who. So you read in the, in the, uh, in the press, every couple of years, weird things happen. For 15 minutes, most of the internet traffic runs through a particular uh, piece of the network owned by China or some other country. These capabilities are becoming broadly used by a lot of people for spying and potentially for worse. You saw this in cell phone security. I talked about the, uh, the authentication. There's, there's no encryption for most of a cell phone call. There is encryption between the phone and the, the first base station. It is a very weak encryption. And the decision was made back, back when the protocol, the standards were, were decided on, that doing strong encryption would be expensive. It would cost more CPU power, require a stronger chip. And that it wasn't really needed because eavesdropping on those frequencies was hard. It was not something a hobbyist can do. Right now it's easy. So we have to start designing these systems for security. The, uh, this, this is also the, the backdoor debate. In the United States, big debate between the FBI and pretty much everybody else uh, on whether you should design communication systems to have eavesdropping capabilities built in. Right? Fine idea for law enforcement, but I can't limit the functionality to law enforcement, or at least uh, I can't limit it to law enforcement that I like. I build the functionality, anyone can use it. As we move to a world where these systems become more capable, potentially deadly, we cannot afford to make that trade-off. So prioritizing uh, defense over offense has uh, other ramifications, like disclosing and fixing vulnerabilities, encrypting as much as possible, separating security from spying, funding law enforcement so they can do forensics better, Funding research, facilitating trust. And we need to start thinking this way. Other thing we need to do to uh, echo a point Alessio made is to build for resilience. Right? If we cannot design systems that are secure out of the box, we need to build bigger systems that can deal with that that can assume insecurity and work anyway. Resilience is a really interesting property. You'll hear it talked about on everything from oh, biological systems, social systems, technical systems. It's kind of an emergent property. It's a combination of, of many different things. Survivability, mitigation, recovery, restorability. But it's really the ability of a system to maintain its functionality in the face of attacks, in the face of perturbations. I think we need to think more about resilience in our own systems. So this is a talk a lot about the security of our, of our systems in our daily lives, but it's also a talk about military systems. In the 1980s, we made a very conscious decision to not have separate military engineering in, in most cases. It's the same chips, the same computers, the same designs that are in your home are in weapon systems, are in systems being used by militaries. I mean, it's no longer separate. In the US we called it COTS, probably had other names elsewhere. 
So it really is one world, one answer. And right now, it's a world of increasingly capable computers, increasingly dangerous threats, and we need to really rethink how we do security. Right? Like, uh, like Tomas, I'm not known for my optimism. Actually, that's not true. I am known for my optimism. In this case, I'm, I'm less optimistic. Right? He talked about one particular solution at one point and gave it a, what, a 10% chance that will do it. I think that's about right. The economic drivers for the situation we're in are very strong. We like our cheap electronics. Right? We like our very capable computers. You know, we don't want to be told that uh, we're going to design things differently, less capable and more expensive. So we need to figure out how to maintain security even though. So thank you. I have some time for questions. <laughs> but, but first I will, I will take the mysterious white bag they're giving to all speakers. Do you know by now? I saw you sneaked into that. Do you I, know, I, know by now what we have here? So I did. There was actually a mysterious white bag on the floor there, and I peeked this morning. I'm not going to tell you because it's better it's mysterious. Top secret. It is. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. Here's your secret Let's, gift. So are there any questions? The gentleman over there, there are actually two questions um, on the, the side. Why don't you just get, uh, it's going... I think we do have uh, plenty of questions for you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, you started your presentation talking about how uh, so software vulnerabilities like the core of this poorly made and at cheap cost. A lot of the developers I speak to um, say that they, they really wish they had a hacker's mindset, that they actually kind of understood and developed programs with, with taking on the hacker's mindset. Do you think more can be done in this sense um, to try and help imbue them with this mindset? Or is it just simply too much in the face of this kind of globalized chaos that you, you talked about? Um, yeah, it'd be good to hear your comments, thanks. I think a hacker's mindset is great. And, and there is a lot of work trying to uh, imbue computer science curriculums with security training. You know, not as a separate course, but as part of everything. Lots of people working on this, lots of people writing about it. It is an excellent idea. Uh, my worry is that in the face of, oh, this product is due on Thursday, you know, the things you drop are the things that are, don't obviously affect functionality at the moment. Security is a hard thing to design because you're designing against a potential future problem. So the economic realities of shipping something now make that harder. But yes, uh, security engineering, teaching programmers to do this better, uh, sort of innately, would be very useful and very powerful. I think the economic drivers are stronger, but it is, it is a great part of the solution. Long term, though, I mean, people who are training now, when it, before they start getting imbued into the workforce in a majority, you know, it might be a couple of decades. Do we have another question? I see a hand there, I see a hand there. Yeah, we do see have a hand there. Over there, we have a microphone right there. Thank you. I'm Nita Pais for the Estonian Information System Authority. And going back to what you said about the CIA triad, it's true that on the ground we've seen massive attacks against confidentiality and availability for the best part of a decade, at least, on a mass societal impact scale. But given the trends that you see today, what would you say is the most likely mass impact attack on integrity and how exactly will that affect our societies? Yeah, I, I don't know and I always worry about outlining scenarios because I think they sort of unduly scare people rather than look at their broad trends. Uh, I think availability attacks are coming. You start reading uh, some of the, uh, the US discussions, the uh, Global Threat Report uh, and, and they talk about availability attacks, sorry, integrity attacks as being very powerful and very dangerous. And what's interesting is there aren't a lot of good standards. And so you think of confidentiality, we have a lot of rules. Right? GDPR is about confidentiality. And there are others. For availability, there's all sorts of contractual obligations of meantime, of meantime failures, meantime uh, up. And we know how to do availability. We really don't know how to 
demand integrity in the same way. So there is a, a sort of a gap in how we as, as people, as buyers, can demand some kind of integrity measure. So I think those, that is going to be the place where we're going to see new attacks. They're, in a lot of cases, less criminal because it's, it's a little harder to monetize them. And so availability attacks are, it's uh, DDoS attacks, which are monetized in various ways, and ransomware, which is sort of obviously monetized. So you see that as very common criminal attacks right now. Uh, it, integrity attacks are more subtle. So I see them as uh, potential nation state attacks in hostilities. And, and we sort of know this in information doctrine. Sure, it's, uh, you can destroy some communication system, but that is the least useful thing you can do with it. The most useful is to eavesdrop on it and then be able to selectively add and delete messages. And so those kind of integrity attacks are very powerful in, in warfare and in other hostilities. So I don't know where the, uh, you know, the, the news article that will cause us all to think about integrity will happen. I mean, will it be some malicious attack in a hospital? Will it be, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, GPS data? But I think it is coming. So we had another question over there. Hi, I'm Carlos with CERT Latvia. Uh, I think the integrity is already being attacked, for example, in uh, business email compromise. Uh, actually, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And that's, and that's a way to monetize it. That's actually yeah. a very good point. Uh, so my question is, like, in hospitals, we have, like, two sets of uh, knives and forks, right? One for operation theater and the other in the canteen. And in cyber, everybody is happy with, like, one network, one device, your porn, your cat videos, your mission critical stuff, all running in the same environment. And, like, you already mentioned the, the regulation and the government role. So Basically, what should we do with uh, engineers and uh, car company execu executables who put like uh, engine control and, right. and entertainment system and everything on one network, which is really crazy. In, yeah, like, I mean, everybody. in my book, I talk about this notion of decentralizing and, and that it's power, and also for pulling things off the internet. And so this hotel, I'm sure the hotel wireless we're all using is the same network that they run their payment system on. I mean, it's not a different network. I mean, a different subnet, but just barely. So yes, I think there's, there's a lot, there's a strong role for decentralization, decentralization, distribution, for pulling things off networks entirely. Uh, again, it's hard to do because it's additional cost. Right? The reason hotel does it this way because it's the cheapest way to do it. And you know, convincing them to add to a cost against a theoretical future threat is hard. But in some ways, I think we've reached the high watermark of connectivity. Or, or will soon, that, that we are very much in a connected all mentality. And I think in the future we'll make much more conscious decisions about what to connect and how to connect it. I think we are less secure now when there, I mean, 10 years ago, what, there were 10,000 of email providers. Now there are six, eight. I think there's insecurity there, right? Even though Gmail is probably, you know, more secure than anyone else can do, they are now a much richer target than there be tens of thousands. So th there's a lot of, of engineering in here, a lot of details. Again, it's going to be a matter of, of convincing companies to, uh, to spend the money. And that's what I see regulations doing. That regulation is going to change the cost-benefit ratios that companies will, will have to deal with when they make all of these decisions about you know, whether to engineer for security, whether, whether to, uh, to use a more distributed system, whether to not put something on the internet. I mean, I mean Tomas talked about that. It is now cheaper to buy a very powerful computer and stick it in a, a low-cost device than it is to buy a specialized low-cost computer. Right? And that's, that's good economics, but it's bad security. And that's all part of, uh, of the things we can do if there is the economic will. I think we could go on forever. We could uh, go on forever, but we're not. But unfortunately, we um, are running out of time. Thank you again for your great uh, presentation. Thank you.